Josh Haston here, Israel Uncensored, Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. Thanks so much for joining us. I am here in Jerusalem. And full disclosure, I am actually recording this show on the 26th of September. This is my pre-Sukkot holiday show, but I'm actually recording it before Yom Kippur here. Uh, I'm going to be unavailable to record it on the actual day when the show is going to be released on the 2nd of October. But this is the pre-Sukkot show, information about the upcoming holiday that I want to share with you. But before we do that, and of course, a lot could possibly have changed between the time of this recording and uh, the time you're actually hearing it. Uh, This morning here, Tuesday morning, the 26th, horrible news, three Israelis murdered in a terror attack at the entrance to Har Adar, a jihadist, a Muslim, um, with a work permit, actually, to work in the community using taking advantage of of Israel's employment opportunities, um, waiting in line to enter the community as if he was coming to work that day, taking out a gun and shooting and murdering three Israelis. They're right now, as I'm recording, they're starting to release the names of the victims. So by the time you hear this, I won't say uh, ancient news because when, when three Jews are murdered, it's still irrelevant, even if it's uh, six days later. But um, there are probably a lot more developments uh, now that you're listening to the show. But I had to mention that here since I'm actually recording here on a very, very sad morning here in Israel on Tuesday, the 26th. So on that note, we are going to switch gears and do the best that we can to talk about the wonderful holiday of Sukkot in Hebrew, Zman Simchatenu, the time of our happiness we're supposed to be happy, and hopefully it'll be a happy holiday for everyone. So here, joining me on the program to discuss Sukkot, uh, the meaning of the holiday, what it's all about, is our scholar in residence. We haven't spoken to him in a while, Rabbi Guy Avihud, and he runs what is called Haboidim. They are second-hand clothing stores in two convenient locations in Jerusalem, one in the Talpiot area and one in the center of town. And not only are they a second-hand clothing shop, but they provide... Uh, employment opportunities from pe- for a whole slew of people who are recovering from various mental disabilities, mental illnesses, giving them an opportunity to go back to work, a stepping stone back into society. So it's an amazing organization. It's an amazing endeavor. And, uh, of course, the rabbi, our scholar residents, the Rabbi Guy Avihud, uh, on this unfortunately tragic morning here in Jerusalem, and you can actually hear we're outside uh, you can hear the cars going by and the bicycles, but it'll let everybody a little bit uh, somber this morning in uh, in Israel and in Jerusalem. But Rabbi, welcome to the show. Thank you, Josh. It's a pleasure to be here. So we are going to get to the holiday of Sukkot. It's a an eight day festival. If you include the final day, Simchat Torah. Uh, just if you can give us a a briefing on what we're talking about here. I think in English it's called Feast of Tabernacles. Is that correct? Yes. In English, Sukkot. Yeah, Feast of Tabernacles. Feast never... of booths, maybe. That's right. That's right. The booths, because it's about the booths. It's about being outside, and it's interesting that we're sitting outside here, outside in Jerusalem. Speaking about Sukkot, speaking about the booths, because the holiday is a very spiritual holiday. It's a very physical holiday in, in that it has a lot of elements, but it's a very spiritual holiday as well. That's why it comes after Rosh Hashanah, that's why it comes after Yom Kippur, right after, right? You finish Yom Kippur and you're supposed to start building your, your sukkah right away to start preparing yourself for the holiday, as I know that you do every year. I I think that the the real meaning of Sukkot is a spiritual meaning. But we can't get to a spiritual meaning without having it grounded in physical manifestations. So we're commanded to leave our house and leave our comfort and eat, sleep, entertain, do everything that we do in a Sukkah, outside, in a temporary house. It's a temporary establishment because it teaches us that this world is temporary. I think if you do it in the middle of winter, if you do it in the middle of summer, it's harder to understand. But uh, since it's after the high holidays, and we've gotten to a point where we're feeling more spiritual, we're closer to God, we're closer to our spiritual sides, then we can understand that our existence in this world is actually a spiritual existence in a physical body. So this is what Sukkot's about. It's a spiritual holiday in a physical setting. 
You're listening to Israel Uncensored here on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. We are here with Rabbi Guy Avi Hood, head of Haboydim, uh, secondhand clothing stores in Jerusalem, talking about the holiday of Sukkot, the festival of booths, the time of our happiness. Zman Simchatenu. So, Rabbi, let me ask you, the holiday has been coined the time of our happiness. I mean, we have plenty of happy holidays. Hanukkah, we have Purim. We can even uh, argue that Yom Kippur is a happy holiday, even though you're fasting, even though it might be difficult. Some say it's the happiest day of the year. You have Passover, which celebrates the exodus of Egypt. What is uh, the reason specifically why Sukkot is singled out as the time of our happiness? Zman Simchatenu. Well, well, let's start with Yom Kippur. Uh, because you mentioned that Yom Kippur is a happy time because our sins are being absolved as we as we go through Yom Kippur and we're close to God. Uh, this year Yom Kippur is on, on Saturday, on Shabbat. And there's a mitzvah to eat on Shabbat. Uh, actually, eating is one of the main things that we're supposed to do uh, on Shabbat and to commemorate Shabbat. We're supposed to eat extra meals even to, to show how, how much we love Shabbat. And this year we're not eating at all. So the rabbis ask, how can you be happy on Shabbat and you're supposed to you're supposed to be happy on Shabbat. Shabbat, how can you do it? Well, you're not eating. So it says that Yom Kippur triumphs over that, and the fact that you can get closer to God is such happiness that it comes on top uh, or instead of eating on Shabbat. You actually rece- achieve greater happiness by being closer to God than by eating to be closer to God. So you're right that this is, um, an, this is a time of happiness. But Sukkot is the time of most happiness. And I think that uh, it's because uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we're, we're a little bit thinking about ourselves, our year, what we've done last year, what we've uh, accomplished last year, what, things that we should be, do better this year. And we, we look at ourselves as individuals and how we can move forward, or as individuals in a community. But Sukkot is all about the community. Sukkot is all about coming together and having guests in your sukkah, eating together, taking your family out from their home, from their element. You know, all the kids in my house, we all sleep in the sukkah. And it's nice because I have a, I have a fairly big house. It's not huge, not an American-sized house, but it's a fairly big house. Yeah, we have enough bedrooms. On Sukkot, everybody leaves their bedrooms, and we all go to the to the sukkah, which is outside on my porch. We put mattresses all over the floor, and we all sleep there together. We're we're all there, really with each other, and we see how we don't need each uh, we don't need to live by our standards where we need our own space and we need to have our own individualism. We leave our individualism, we leave our comfort. And we go and we see how much happiness we have by coming together, by having people over. You should see the sukkah in my house. Uh, we have guests over. I come out. I take. I take out the tables. We take out the food. The guests leave. We take. We fold the tables. We put them aside. We bring the couches. We sit there. We enjoy. We we talk. We laugh. And then comes night. We take out the couches. We bring back the the tables. We have dinner. We have dinner, we finish with that, we fold the tables, we bring the, the mattresses. So I say I have, I have a, a tiny little house and a, huge, and a huge storage space because my house turns into a storage space. And I think that it gives us real happiness because we pursue the physical things all the time. And it's never enough. You can always pursue more physical things. But when you can concentrate on the important things, then that's the ha- real happiness. And the holiday itself, and that's a great, uh, I think, insight into what actually people do in terms of preparing their house and making their sukkah actually their living space and doing everything inside of that space, uh, whether it's eating or sleeping and everything else. But we we actually just discussed off air a few minutes ago the source of the holiday itself when the uh, children of Israel, B'nai Israel, in Sefer Shmot, the book of Exodus, were in the desert. They were they got to a place called Sukkot, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And from that source, that's where the word comes from. And we talked about not only did they build, if I'm not mistaken, these temporary dwellings in the desert, but more than that, they were also protected and sheltered as we are in our Sukkot here in this day and age. They were protected by the clouds of Hashem, the protective clouds of Hashem, uh, which kept them safe from all the elements, meaning they didn't get 
you know, it's a desert. You would think that their shoes would wear out. You would think that they'd get too hot. You would think that there'd be no food and water. Yet God protected them with these clouds and provided them with all the essentials that they needed as they were in the desert for 40 years as a result of their sins, unfortunately, uh, that additional 39 years. But talk about the uh, the root in terms of the biblical references to the word sukkah, the word sukkot, and about God's protection in terms of the clouds, which are guarding the people of Israel, and how that relates to today. So I see today we're in uh, full disclosure mode. So many people don't know that you are my favorite and longest standing <laughs> chavruta, longest standing learning partner. We've been learning for many, many years, every week, or trying to meet every week. And, and yes, this morning we learned about, about Sukkot, and there is a machloket, there is a dispute. Why? What are the Sukkot supposed to represent? Are they supposed to represent the huts, where uh, Rabbi Akiva says that the Sukkot are supposed to represent the huts, because we didn't have a lot. When we came out of Egypt, we had almost nothing. We were in the desert, and we needed protection, basic protection, from the wind, from the sun, and that's why we had the hut. And we were reminded of where we came from. We had nothing. Rabbi Eliezer, on the other hand, says uh, the Sukkot remind us of the clouds that protected us, and there were seven clouds that uh, protected the, the people of Israel when we came out of Egypt. Six were one on each side, meaning north, north, south, east, west, on top of us, above and below, so we don't have to step in the desert and, and meet all the snakes and everything that's in the desert. By the way, I don't want to cut you off, but this is something new for me. I always thought there was only two clouds, and now I learned that there were actually seven. Oh, yeah, we were, we were, in, we were encased in clouds. You know, today everybody has their protective cases on their phones, that's what we were. Hashem just protected us from all, all sides. Plus, there was one in front leading the way. There was one, one cloud. That's the beauty of uh, sitting outside. There was, there was one cloud that didn't just show the way, but it took the mountains and it flattened the mountains and it raised the valleys so that we, have, that we could walk straight and we didn't, wouldn't have to walk up and down. So there were seven clouds. And Rabbi Eliezer says that this is what we're remembering in Sukkot, where we're, again, encased by Hashem. We, look, we sit in our Sukkah and we look up and we look to the sides and we're inside, we're surrounded by a mitzvah, surrounded by the closeness of God. And I think that it's not, it's not actually a contradiction. Rabbi Akiva says that we have to remember the days when we had nothing. Rabbi Eliezer says, we remember how amazing it is to have the closest to, uh, closeness to Hashem and to be close to, close to God. And I think it, both are the same. If we are so attached to our physical, be physical things, then we can't really be close to God. If we can't remember and, be hum and, and have humility on where we came from and what's basic for us, then we can't really be close to God by remembering having nothing. By having humility, that's how we become close to God. And that's also how we merit the closeness to God. Uh, merit the closeness to God is, is actually something that de depends on us because God is all over the place. God is everywhere, all the time. It's a question, do we see it? Do we acknowledge it? And sometimes when we're chasing after our cars and our houses and our money and our pride, then we don't give God, we don't see God in the everyday. When we peel out, peel off everything, then we can see God. And that's why Sukkot had to come four or five days after Yom Kippur. Because we've already done, you want it or not, you're feeling different after Yom Kippur. You're feeling different. It's even a physical thing. You're a little more tired, you're a little more worn down. Your pride is worn down because you haven't eaten. For those who woke up for Slichot, that's also going to shul, just schlepping around, just the, the physical matter of it helps to take you down a notch. When you've taken down a notch, then you can see life for what it is and appreciate it. And, and then, I mean, you go down a little bit and then potentially, spiritually, you can rise up a lot higher. So the circuit brings you back down to earth, brings you back down to our reality, and then after doing so, elevates you to a, a, uh, a high spiritual plane, a high spiritual level, where you have this 
uh, sense of uh, ultimate happiness as being the Zman Simchatenu. Right, it's a, it's a catapult. And that's why the cloud surrounded us everywhere. Because once you realize that you're surrounded by godliness, then you have a lot more comfort. Uh, I think even the, the lulav that we hold and we shake, it's not a, it's not a straight, rigid thing. It, it moves around. It's a, a palm branch, it's a, yes? It's a new palm branch. It's, closed, it's a closed palm branch, but it has elasticity. And you move it up and down, you move it to the sides, and it shows that life is elastic. La life goes everywhere. And uh, I think that a lot of, uh, a lot of our discomfort, our unhappiness, is because we're, un we're rigid, we're unfluid. And once we, bec we set into this fluidity, and we loosen up our rig rig rigidness or rigidity, rig rigidness, yeah, whatever, right. foreign language. <laughs> uh, once we once we're more fluid, then we can appreciate life, and we can appreciate God, and we can appreciate our friends, we can appreciate our family, and this is what brings happiness. So you brought up the lulav. That is one of the four species which we are commanded by God to take in our possessions and use during the services throughout Sukkot. The other three being the etrog, which looks looks like a lemon if you haven't seen one, yeah. but it's not a lemon. It's a different fruit. And the hadas and the arava. One is a what a myrtle, and uh, what's the other one in English? I can't remember. Okay. Myrtle and the well, if you're out it there, it comes in a set. It right. comes in a set. That's a... I'll have to the myrtle. I can't believe it's on tip of my tongue. Listen, when you live in Israel long enough, your English goes. And the rabbi, <clears throat> who's been here even longer than myself, I believe. Uh, is a testament to that. But you take the four species. I'll have to find out. And maybe everybody's Googling now. Aravot in English. I know it's a palm. It's a etrog, citrus fruit. It is a, a myrtle. And it is a willow. Willow? Willow. willow. I yeah, think it's willow. a willow. And you take them. You hold them together. And if you're a, an observer who's never seen this, it probably looks like, you know, just a crazy, crazy custom of holding these four branches in your hands and what looks like a lemon and marching around the synagogue. We're, we're nearly out of time here, and we could talk about Sukkot for hours and hours, but if you can, just give a, a, just a brief meaning as to, you mentioned the lulav, the palm. What is the purpose and meaning of the other three symbols? Why do we take them and the overall as a whole when we bring them and hold them together? What is the purpose and meaning of it? I said that um, the Rosh Hashanah and uh, Yom Kippur are more about the individual, and Sukkot is about the community. And the four species represent four different types of people. And uh, Sukkot comes to show us that we take the four people, four types of people, and we put them together. And that's the strength that we have as Am Israel. Some people are a little more, uh, they have a little more wisdom to them. Some have a little more earthiness to them. Some are are better you know at connecting to god and some are very physical it depends depends on who the person is but we can always make sure that we're amisled when we come together that's the only thing that brings us together i think it's very you know we we live in this political time where everybody tries to to put us in categories and and devise us and this it's not judaism judaism and amisled has been built on coming and bringing things together and I think that we fall into this uh, trap this modern world trap of putting people in their specific boxes are you part of this minority this minority this? I'm a part of minority my name's Guy I'm the only Guy of Yehud out there I'm my own minority and even if there's somebody named Guy of Yehud out there it's not me I'm my own minority but I don't look at myself as a minority I look at where I can connect to somebody else so once we stop dividing ourselves and bring us, bring us all together, and it doesn't matter if you come from the right, from the left, from north, from south, from east, from west, west once we come together, then we achieve the happiness that you spoke about in, in the beginning of being Am Israel, in Eretz Israel, hopefully all of us, in the time of Sukkot. And I, um, I can't stress enough how important that, that message is. I mean, uh, it would seem, at least on the surface, it's been a very uh, devi divisive year. Is that the word divisive in English? Yeah. Uh, amongst the children of, of Israel, here in Israel, whether it's the Western Wall situation or all other types of uh, religious issues or 
issues involving the land and all these other different issues. And we all have different opinions. And on my show, I'm very clear about my beliefs and my opinions. And there are people who agree and there are people who disagree. But I think that on Sukkot, regardless of what your personal or political or religious uh, affiliations or beliefs are, I think that's the ultimate message um, that God is trying to teach us. Only when the Jewish people are united and unified can we move forward, can we accomplish and can we thrive in this world? And I don't want to say it's all been negative. I'm seeing images now of, you know, Israelis flying halfway across the world to Mexico to aid in, the, in victims of an earthquake and Israelis flying to Florida and helping in the, the hurricane relief. And I'm seeing people give tzedakah, raise literally hundreds of thousands of dollars for people who have different, different illnesses here in Israel and abroad. It's very easy to help somebody who's far. I think the the measurement of how we can come together and how we really can help is if we help the pre- people next to us, our next door neighbor. You know, the one that makes noise exactly when you want to sleep, the one that wakes up your kids because they're on their drums or something. <laughs> Let's show love to, to the people closest to us. That's a good point. It's, That's it's a good easier, point. I like that. It's easier to help, you know, somebody in Mexico. Right. It's much harder to to show love to that guy that just cut me off on the street. Uh, that's what I was about to say. Is we're here in uh, right off of uh, it's one of the main arteries in downtown Jerusalem, and I'm watching uh, somebody get in their car literally right now, and you know possibly holding up another car trying to get by. Actually, he didn't honk, so yeah. maybe there's some yeah, hope there. Right. But yeah, it's but the spirit of the high holidays. But but I appreciate that. I think it's also I agree wholeheartedly. It's a, also important to help the guy next door as well as uh, those in Mexico or Florida or, or everywhere else. Um, I do think it starts at home. I'm not going to disagree I, with I you there. I'm glad you brought it up. I don't think it's a bad thing to help me, the people of Mexico. Right. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. No, I hear but what you're I saying. But I think it's, it's very important to also do it at home and not to be a tzaddik when it's really far away or to send something far and then at home to scream at people or your family or but, your kids or you but know. you know what you make a good point and we're going to end with this though um you know some people have a, a misconception of what tikkun olam is and if you actually learn the sources of what tikkun olam is it's exactly what rabbi guy just said um of course it involves helping others and helping people in need but the first thing you're supposed to do when you're trying to make the world a better place is number one help yourself make sure you're on the right path secondly help your family third help your neighbors fourth help your country uh your city and then your country and then the rest of the world so that that is really you know unfortunately tikkun olam has been and we're not going to get into that discussion now has been misinterpreted i think uh way way too often but i'm glad you made that point about the neighbor and on that note we are going to end again this is the uh, version of uh, Israel Uncensored for the 2nd of October 2017. Recording just a little bit earlier because uh, in all honesty, I'm going to be too busy uh, building the sukkah before the holiday, gathering the four species as uh, described by the rabbi. I was just reminded I have some branches I need to cut down uh, above the sukkah so that my sukkah is kosher. So I got to get busy with that. Hence, I'm recording in advance. So let's just say one last time, may God avenge the blood of those who were murdered in, in today's attack, today being the 26th of September, the 6th of Tishrei, in Har Adar, the three holy Jews murdered simply because they're Jewish. doesn't matter if they're in Har Adar and what the political affiliation of that community is or people there are. If you're Jewish, uh, the jihadists and the enemies of Israel will try to hurt you regardless of what your political beliefs are, your religious beliefs. If you live in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Gush Etzion, or Haradar, it doesn't really matter. Unfortunately, we saw that this morning. Um, on the other hand, let's remember this is a time of happiness, Sukkot, entering the Sukkah, and uh, giving our belief and protection, turning that over, turning that over to God. That's really the ultimate symbol of Sukkot. Um, as the weather gets a little cooler, we leave the comfort of our homes and go out into the sukkah and count on God's protection. On that note, thank you, Rabbi Guy Vihud. Have a happy holiday, happy Sukkot. All the best to you and all your loved ones, and uh, let's talk again soon. Thank you, Josh. Always always a pleasure with you. And that'll do it. Get in touch with me during the week, Josh, at thelandofisrael.com. On Facebook, it's Joshua Haston. Let me know what you think of the show. Love it, hate it, comments, questions. Feel free. I would be happy to read your emails on the air on Twitter, at Josh Haston. I am signing off. For the wonderful, beautiful holiday of Sukkot, it's probably the nicest time of the year here in Israel. There's a lot of nice times. Spring, summer, winter, fall. 
but this in particular, Zman Simchatenu, the time of our happiness, is a beautiful time. Uh, between now and when we speak again, I don't know if we're going to have a show next week. It's Kolom Wed Sukkot, so I'm not sure if there's going to be a show, but if it's next week or in two weeks from now, most importantly, everybody out there, wherever you are in this world of ours, a wonderful world of ours, be safe. Shalom, shalom from Jerusalem. Chag Sukkot Sameach. There are many ways to understand time in history, and we've been spending a lot of time talking about it. But one thing is for sure, time flows like a river. The past is behind us, and it's not coming back. Listen to The Jewish Story with Ralph Mike Foyer.